wanting to see y'all. Kind of, I did. All right, all right. Y'all worship with us. We waited for this day. We gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Great to see you. You may be seated for just a, just a moment. Man, we love to fellowship here. We love to have you a part of our service today. <clears throat> and I am honored here to be able to be here today, too, with you. And I'm excited, certainly, for what the Lord's going to do in our heart today. And, uh, man, you just I, I just am grateful 
grateful, grateful for your, your, uh, just your kindness and goodness whenever we have this time of fellowship. And uh, I know it's, uh, it's just special. So I appreciate Jim and the praise team leading us and all that good stuff. So if you got a copy of your worship guide, just for a moment, we need to look in here real quick. Just got a couple things need to point out to you that I need to point out. Um, first of all, next Sunday we will have our, have our church uh, business meeting. Uh, next, uh, over the next couple of weeks, the Margaret Lackey State Offering Promotion. Our goal this year is $1,100. You know that we take up an offering for Annie Armstrong, we take up an offering for Lottie Moon, but the uh, Margaret Lackey offering has to do with our state missions, our state missions. So I hope that you'll be faithful. We'll have our in gathering on the 29th, so please make sure of that. This afternoon at 4.30 uh, is our going fishing visitation, if you would like to be a part of that. But let me say this, I don't, I don't, I do, uh, we don't have child care. If that limits you, that's okay. But uh, next month, I'll try to make sure I get, some, get that. But uh, anyway, we're going to go out and make some visits to some of our own folks and some of our people out into the community. But um, just know that. So this afternoon at 430, we'll meet right there, right back here in the conference room. On the back, take a moment, go to the back, back page, and you'll see that bottom there, Ladies Life Group on the 19th, Kids Movie Night on the 21st. I'll get to this one in just a moment about our 60th anniversary celebration, but our fall festival, October 26th, so make sure you see that, and um, I'm wondering if I have left out anything. I know the children next week, is that right, Heather? Children, is that next Saturday? The Mission Madness in Gulfport? Yes. Okay, you want to say something about that real quick? Um, the children, any, um, any child, kindergarten through um, whatever age. We're going to Gulfport Baptist, and we're going to be um, exploring all the different missions that people in Mississippi go and do for um, serve how they where they serve in mission for. Oh, I can't. Even I can't talk. talk either this morning. As so. missionaries, <laughs> we're going to work. So we're talking about all the Western places. So the theme is cowboy stuff. So they will be talking about South Dakota. They're going to be talking about um, I think Montana, and just different areas over in the West area. So our kids can learn where some of our missionaries in Mississippi are serving. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate that and appreciate our children's ministry for teaching our children that. I appreciate that. If you got it, if you will, hold this. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Sir? Oh, that's right. Yes, sir. Seniors, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our senior adult luncheon will be this Friday at 11 o'clock at, at Brady's. So if there's, I think there's a sign-up sheet out there. If there's not... Just know that. We'll send a message out to you. That's right. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. All right. Look inside a moment for this right here. In a couple of weeks, in a couple of weeks, we will be celebrating our church 60th anniversary as a church. God has been faithful. This church is uh, God's church, and we're going to celebrate with, with, a, with a concert with by Deliverance 5. Explains who that is, but I hope that you can be here, and I encourage you to invite former members Former members, we're going to send something out to our members also, but we're getting these invitations done, followed by we need your help to bring a potluck, your favorite dish or dessert, and I know we'll have plenty to share, but we're going to celebrate 60 years here at Temple Baptist Church, September 22nd, 10 a.m. Make sure you see that, 10 a.m. Make sure you put that down. We won't have Sunday school that morning, but we're going to have a, our service here at 10 so I hope that you'll be here looking forward to it, our 60th anniversary. So anyway, I'm going to ask our men if they'd be making their way forward. And uh, we want to take up our, our offering this morning. And I'm, as I continue to say, thank you for giving. Thank you for being faithful. We're even coming, we're even knocking down the little uh, stuff on the uh, air conditioner units. So we still need 66, a little over 6,000. But you've been faithful to give. And uh, we appreciate that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, we'll take up our morning offering. Father, thank you, God, for this day. Thank you that we can be here today to worship you. God, I know there's a lot going on. But, Lord, in these moments, in this moment today, right here, right now, God, prepare our hearts. Thank you that we can give in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Praise and treasures that fade never enough. 
mother. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, oh, oh there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I've got a friend to show. pray together father thank you god that there is no one better than you hallelujah 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 and god on this day we come to worship our supreme god you are above any other god little g out there and god we praise you we give you honor and glory and god thank you thank you thank you that we're here today father these tithes and offerings god thank you for blessing us Lord, we continue, uh, we continue to honor you. We want to continue to honor you with our giving. Thank you so much for everyone who sacrifices and brings their tithes and offerings, God. 
your word it says that we we obey and in that way that you will bless tremendously and god we continue to ask for your favor to be upon us when it comes especially to our giving thank you for this time of worship god thank you for your spirit being here god we give you all the glory and praise thank you father for your goodness and grace in jesus name amen let's give the lord a hand clap this morning for our offering that's right that's right that's right children Children, 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 we want to be making your way uh, to Kids Church. Man, it's always good to see our, see our children. Appreciate them very, very much. Just grateful for them. Love their enthusiasm and love their, love their energy. That's right, girl. You go, girl. Love their energy and all that good stuff. And the ones that lead it, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. You lead it. All right. All right. We're going to take this time. We, we have a, a time that we kind of call altar call. It's not the invitation sort of at the end, but it's a time when you can come up and kind of, if you haven't taken time to, to get with the Lord this morning, this is a time where you can do it at your seat. You're welcome to come down to the altar. A lot of people come down to the altar and just take time and just acknowledge God for being God. This is also a time when it's a great opportunity to pray for, maybe you have something on your mind that you want to pray for. This is a great time to, to come down and pray for that. It's also a good time to be in prayer because Brother Guy is coming up to, to, give the, to give the word. And you don't know what kind of spiritual battles he's been fighting to bring this to you and to me. And so we want to we wanna help lift up his arms. We want to we wanna help him go into battle and, and be the church and be beside him. So if you, if you don't have anything else that that you can think of. You be in prayer for Brother Guy as he ministers this morning. So would y'all stand with us and we're going to open up the altars at this time and you're welcome to sing, you're welcome to worship, you're welcome to come down and pray. This is just a time of just, of just worship where we just enter into worship. Yes. 
true hope, our, 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 our deepest hope, if we put it in anything else, if we put it in money, whatever else, fill in the blank, if we put it in anything else besides you, it's sinking sand. We need to build our, our lives around Christ, the solid rock. He never moves. He never changes. He's always there. God, you're always there for us. Even in times when we don't know that you're there, God, you're always there for us. It's your grace and your mercy. It's your grace and your mercy. God, thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Where would we all be without some level of your grace and your mercy? And maybe some of us have never experienced 
letting Christ be Lord of our lives. And God, I pray that today that maybe that person would make that decision today. Maybe if there's somebody after Brother Guy comes and, and they're feeling drawn to join in the church, God, that today would be the day. Maybe if there's someone else that feels a call to ministry, full-time ministry, in whatever capacity God decides, that today would be the day that they would surrender their heart and their life. And God, maybe it's just a person that comes to church all the time and they're just tired of the same old existence, the same old religious existence. And they want to dive deeper into relationship. God, I pray that you would take us deeper, take us farther than our feet could ever wander. And God, take us to a place where you'd have us go. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Jim. Sing that a cappella on Christ the solid rock. Let's sing that a on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Get on Christ the solid rock I stand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I promise you that one day we are just going to just let go and, and, and sing and worship him uh, for a whole service. I mean, that's just powerful. The Lord is just powerful. Amen. And we come in this room to worship him. And I'm so grateful for Jim and our praise team and how he's working all that and doing that, involving others and stuff it's not about a show he would be the first one to tell you it's not about a show but boy we want to be led to the throne of God and I'm grateful that we can be a part of that and uh, man just powerful powerful stuff so anyway th I want to thank you for being here this morning I certainly do man it's great to have have each of you today and um, I know the Lord is doing something very unique in this church and I'm very grateful for that uh, my wife is sitting with two very precious people, um, David and Jane Boyd, here in the middle. These, these two people uh, go way back, especially even before I met them, even before I met them, uh, I met them through my wife. And you know when, I don't know about you, but when you were dating, dating your spouse and you were going to get married, but you know how relationships work. There are some people that just need to know who you're dating and um, David and Jane are really close to my mother and father-in-law and I've known them for over 30 years but when I date, was dating Tommy I was at Mississippi College of course she was too but she would come home on the weekend sometimes but I remember the first time I ever went to that church let me tell you something I was sweating because man I was nervous not knowing all these people but I met David and Jane and they they made sure it had to be like okay you can you can date that guy you can you can you can have my approval but you know it's just it's special like that but I appreciate them being here today man their family's awesome and great great people so anyway if you got your copy of God's Word I want to invite you to open up to the book of Colossians I, I am already excited. I see children ready to take notes and adults ready to take notes. Man, that's just that's just so incredible. Our youth and and um, but we're gonna we're gonna start a journey together. And there's gonna be some Sundays along the way that that you know we'll we'll divert from that. But we're gonna go through this book. I love the book of Colossians. Matter of fact, it's my favorite book in the Bible. Because, as you'll see, there are some very important themes in this book for our life and for the honor and glorification of Jesus Christ. And so, this morning, as I said, we're going to take this journey together. If you're a guest with us today, I want to say thank you very much for being here. I know that I didn't mention that during the welcome, but, you know, sometimes when I'm standing up here, things come through my mind all the time, filtering while I'm talking. It's... But um, if you're a guest, thank you for being here. 
Um, I would, if you could, before you leave, fill out a card that should be in front of you. You got permission to do that during the sermon today. But um, we appreciate you coming to visit us and appreciate you being here. And uh, we want to hopefully get by to see you sometime, just like this afternoon. But uh, we're, we're not there to hound you. We're not there to, to, to cause any trouble, of course. You know, we're just there to love on you. But if you visit us, we, 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 we take pride in that, and we want to return the favor. But, but um, thank you for being here. But a word from Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to begin at the very beginning. And I'm going to kind of just give a general overview about this book today. And, uh, <clears throat> and get into looking at a couple of themes, but we're all going to come back to these things because they're all in different parts of the Bible and what the book of Colossians is about. But Colossians chapter, Colossians chapter 1, beginning verses 1 and 2, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? The very first two verses simply say this, but yet they pack a powerful punch. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, our Father. Lord, I come before you one more time, and God, I pray that this morning, God, you would certainly speak to us. But God, I pray that you'll take this because there's no way I can do it as a human being. But somehow to take the very beginning of a, of a book, the salutation of a book, the greeting of a book, and God turn it into something that's applicable to our lives. But God, I do know this, that your word is powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating even to the bone and marrow. God, thank you for the power of your word. It never returns void. And Lord, I pray that this will be something today that we will see today that God, all glory and honor and praise goes to the one true ultimate God. And that's you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. We love you. And Holy Spirit, fill this place with your presence today already. You have, but fill it even more into our hearts, as Jim said, Lord, to encounter you. So thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Colossians, boy, it's got a lot of things in it. But in these first two verses, whenever you read a book of the New Testament, and especially the writings of Paul, the Apostle Paul, he is the author of 13 books here in the New Testament. Besides Jesus, besides Jesus, one probably one of the most prominent figures in the history of church and the history of Christendom as well. I know that there were great men like Moses. I know there are great men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and uh, uh, just Jeremiah. I mean, there's a lot of folks, Noah. I mean, there's just a lot of people in the Bible that God used. And, but Paul, as you look, probably had one of the greatest impacts as far as taking the gospel, spreading the gospel to people. And even with where we are, somewhere down the line, there's no way to trace it, but somewhere down the line, this is where we are today because of one like the Apostle Paul and the disciples and, and the power of God. So it's, it's a very, it's, it's all, but this is the way that he opens several of his letters. By opening up, by giving a greeting to us. But Paul, as I said, had a great impact in the church. If you, like I said, if you wrote a letter in the New Testament times, they started by immediately identifying the person who was reading it. But when we send letters today, what do we do? We immediately notice the person that we're sending the letter to, and then at the very bottom of it, we usually sign our name. So, but in biblical times, it was important that they knew who was addressing them and knew the purpose and reason why. And most of the time in Paul's letters especially, there's always an indication and a, and a, and a presentation of himself glorifying Jesus Christ God the Father, you even have uh, two of the Trinity here, God the Father, God the Son, and uh, so it was, uh, he does that quite throughout. And um, you, you identify, uh, certainly when you read, this is just like a greeting. And Colossians is a letter written to, very important to know this as well, that this book was written to the, the, the Gentile and Jewish believers at, at the church of Colossae that Paul started. 
So you had a mixture, you had a mixture of Gentiles and you had Jews. You had Jewish believers. And so a lot of this stuff was new to them. A lot of the things in why Paul instructed them was simply because there were some things they needed to be made aware of that was out in the world that they lived in to be aware of that because it could pollute the church and pollute their lives. You've heard me say we've been talking about living by the Spirit of God. Living by the Spirit of God. Do not, let, he said, do not lust after the flesh, but live after the Spirit because that's something that you don't want to do because the flesh is very strong. And we went through that and talked about that for several weeks about walking in the Holy Spirit. And one of those things was walking daily because you had a battle between the flesh and the Spirit. And so God gives us the power to do that, to walk in the Spirit of God. So he is instructing these believers here over some issues that we're going to see, but also takes that and points everyone to just how awesome Jesus is. Now, there's a couple things you probably know already about the Apostle Paul. He's great impact in the church. You know, Paul, he had a passion for God, for Jesus Christ. Paul's encounter, you remember the encounter of Paul when, um, when Jesus met him on the Damascus Road or when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. It was a very defining time about Paul's salvation. And listen, not all of us, not everyone has a Pauline uh, experience with Christ. But that doesn't mean that we're not saved. But I know this, God still saves sinners such as I and you that we know that the power of Christ changes our life. But God used him in a good way because his former life, his former life was doing what? Was killing and persecuting the church of God. So you had a strong leader that was against Christianity against Jesus but God miraculously Jesus miraculously saved him and by the way he used a guy by the name of Stephen you know remember Stephen Stephen one of the early apostles as he stood there and was being stoned to death heaven opened up and Stephen saw the the mighty power of God and saw God on his throne and 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 Jesus sitting at the right hand of God his authority and there at that story when that story ends it it ends was saying here in the book of Acts that there was a man named Saul that was looking down and watching. And this man, Saul, was the one who persecuted the church. So God radically saved him in Acts chapter 9. This is what it says in Acts chapter 9. If you want to turn to it, you can. But Paul, he had a passion for God and for Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, which when you belong to the way, the way it meant to the church of Jesus Christ, who were new believers, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice that said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, I want you to know something. I imagine, I imagine that kind of brought him back somewhat. That when a voice cried out and those around him could not see or hear what was going on, but they noticed something different, the scripture says. But he says, Saul, he says, I am Jesus. Because Saul said, well, who are you? Lord, he already addressed him as Lord. It wasn't a flippant word, but when he heard the voice, something inside of him cried out and said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And it says in verse 7, And the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless, they heard the sound, excuse me, they did hear the sound, but they did not see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. So they led him back to the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And then God gave instructions to Ananias. The bottom line is, is that God, after three days, scales fell from his face, from his eyes, and he was baptized. 
And he was therefore now under the authority and apostleship of Jesus Christ. But he had a passion for God and for Jesus Christ. And in Philippians chapter 3, for a moment, you see this about Paul concerning the author of this great book and, and, and his passion for Jesus Christ. Because it was him who penned these words coming into Christendom and being but, and coming as a Christian. And he, he certainly met with God, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But he says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he had an encounter with Jesus Christ whom he is saying here, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So not only did he have a passion for God, for Jesus Christ, he had a passion for people. He had a tremendous burden for people, mostly Gentile, but yet many Jews around that area during that, during that early first century. He loved them, he prayed for them, he, he led people to Christ. And when you look at this book, if you notice something here, that in several of his books, look in verse 3 of Colossians 1, chapter 1. Says we, he says this, we always thank God the Father for you, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for God's people. This is repeated if you look at the book of like 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Both of those books talk, tell us how Paul loved people. And some, much, several of his books starts out that way. He commends them. Listen, he encourages them about their faith. I want to be someone that encourages you about your faith faith in Christ if you are a believer in Jesus to encourage you to spur you on as a believer that when you walk out of this room here today and walk out into that world that you are fully impressed impressed upon your heart to live for Christ to live by the Holy Spirit and, he, and to thank you for your love and your faithfulness and that's the way church ought to be right there it's the way we ought to be when we come into this place that we Show and demonstrate love for each other, but not only in here, but out there as well. But that's what Paul had a passion for. He had a passion for people. He loved them and prayed for them. And he gave his life for that. And then he had this. He not only did he have a passion for his Lord and Savior, not only did he have his passion for his people, but he had a passion for writing the truth. Listen, when it says here that Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in his apostleship, as a follower of Christ, he wrote down, he wrote down the words of God led by the Holy Spirit to give us what we have today in our New Testament, that God's word is true, God's word is faithful, God's word is powerful, that there are no errors in it. God doesn't make a mistake in writing his word out. But Paul, as I said, 13 of the New Testament books were written. We know that Paul obviously had a great impact and is having a great impact in the work of God because we're sitting here reading and preaching from the book that God led Paul to write. I do not lift up Paul above Jesus, though, but yet he had Jesus' authority by the will of God. And as an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, turn over two books let to the left to the book of, or three books to the book of Galatians for a moment. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 tells us how Paul became authoritative and how Paul, certainly as an apostle of Christ and his apostleship, and let me show you where it came from. Because once he met Jesus on the Damascus road, he didn't just stay there, as you know. He met Ananias, and Ananias gave some instructions for him. And when the scales fell off his eyes and he was baptized, he immediately got up and went on with the work of God. He basically dedicated, or well he did, he dedicated every aspect of his life to God. And he followed him. He lived and breathed Jesus. He lived and breathed the word of God. He lived and breathed leading, leading people to Christ. But here we see in Galatians chapter 1 as we continue this introduction this morning it says this Paul called by God. he says I want you to know brothers and sisters here in the book of Galatians that the gospel I preached is not of human origin I did not receive it from any man nor was I taught it 
Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. That was his seminary. <laughs> that was his training ground. That was his time with the Lord that wasn't immediately set in ministry. He spent years and he learned it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And in this moment that we see here, that he, when he was giving his apostleship and he was learning about Jesus, God was teaching him and showing him and talking to him just as he could talk to you and me today. But the Holy Spirit led his life, but he, yet he received direct revelation from Almighty Jesus. And he goes on to say, verse 13, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father's. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult with any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. And then three after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. And I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is not a lie. And then I went to Syria and Cilicia, and I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. Now listen to this. This is the transformation power of Jesus Christ. And this is what God does in people's lives. When you come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you desire to follow Him, there is a difference, as we'll see here in just a moment, too, of how Paul described the believers there. But look at what he says. I was personally unknown, but they only heard the report, verse 23 of Galatians, the man who formerly, formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of that. So here is a man, Paul, in the letter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, he was an apostle. But what was an apostle? An apostle was this, or his apostleship was this. It's an official representative of the one who sent him God. And that is what gave him his position of authority. What he writes, listen, what he writes is not merely of his own opinion, but God's authoritative word. Can I, can I describe one more time? And by the way, I learned, this, uh, I learned this Friday night at about, excuse me, it was into Saturday morning. I was up to about two or three. God was stirring in my heart. Um, uh, just, anyway, just time alone with God, and, and I couldn't sleep. I was wrestling with something very dear to me, and that is, but I was listening to John MacArthur. John MacArthur is one of my favorite theologians. If you get a chance, look him up. Uh, he's, he's out in California. I've talked about him before. He's, he's got some health issues now, but he's just one of the most in, incredible men of God, led by God, a, a modern-day theologian. Now, there are some things I don't agree with him totally, but that's okay. But for the most part, he was, he was, we were looking at um, the issue of, of Christ. And he said this. He was preaching on the greatest, the, uh, see, what, uh, hang on a second. He, he was preaching on the, uh, the greatest something about the, 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 the biggest doctrine that is persecuted today in today's church. Or the biggest doctrine that Satan hates. Or the biggest doctrine that man hates this world we live in. And he made a comment that startled me. But I see it played out every day. But he made a comment that every six months there is a new religion that is being born in opposition to Christ. Now, if you're an, uh, 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 a theologian like that, you obviously keep up and know the different religions that come about trying to distort, trying to distort Jesus Christ and who he is. 
and what he's about and why he is what he is. But every six months, there are some. So this book, as well as every book of the Bible, is here and put here to demonstrate that there is only one Savior. There's only one Lord, not many lords. And there's only one way into heaven, not many ways into heaven. And just because something sounds good and looks good, sounds good, if it's not in line with the Word of God, folks, it is not of God. If it's not in line with the Word of God. And see, today, well, look, we have, again, so much stuff. But he had a passion for writing the truth. But the only way we got to, the only way to know the truth is to be in God's Word. To let God's Word transform us. And that's what Paul was doing there. And he got it from God. He didn't get it from man. But every six months, there's something new that comes out that's in, that, is, that is in direct um, uh, conflict with who Jesus is. And every one of these religions try to suppress the truth about Jesus and who he is and will try to suppress believers into believing a lie. It generally comes from Satan that Jesus was just an ordinary man, that Jesus was just a just a, a great teacher or a great prophet. No, dear friend, he was the Son of God. He was all supreme. He is the only one, the true God out there that can change somebody's life. And Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, that is who I follow as a believer in him. So it's very important that we understand that foundation that when we look into the Word of God, that we allow the Word of God to speak first. And then we look at other resources to help us understand the Word of God. But what we read in here versus what we read out there, and it's great to read books. Listen, there, there, there are many fantastic books out there, even today, that lift up Jesus Christ and believers that are genuine. That's good for you, absolutely. But this book right here, listen, this book right here is the only book that can transform someone whose life is dead and turn it around into true life with Christ. He's the only one. And so, his apostleship. And then the next thing, number two is this, the description of the Colossians. He says here, he says here, to God's holy people in Colossae. Now, if I were writing a book about Temple Baptist Church... <laughs> I would long to say to the holy ones, brothers and sisters of the church of Temple Baptist or Temple Church, you are part, if you are a believer in Christ, you are part of God's kingdom, not just these four walls. We meet here today because we are a local church right here in Big Point, Mississippi. Temple Church right here. We are a congregation just like many congregations out there. And we want to line up with the Word of God. And one of the ways that we line up with the Word of God is the way Paul described these people in Colossae. He says, to you, God's holy people of Colossae, faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. This word faithful for a moment. He says, to God's holy people, faithful believers. It comes from a word it means to be steadfast in affection or allegiance. Paul was saying, hey, you, you early Christians, you were, you were faithful to God. You were full of faith. You are to be loyal, to be firm in adherence to the promises or in to discharge the duty of the gospel. It means that you are steadfast and you are allegiant. You are faithful to Jesus Christ first. And that's what I noticed about you. You didn't allow the, 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 the things of this world to rock you, to shake you. It doesn't mean, they weren't talking about perfection either. But surely they were believers that struggled, as we'll see, because they struggled about all the different influence from the outside, from the philosophies of Greek and, and uh, uh, the philosophies of Judaism, all these things out there, the same stuff today. Same stuff today that tries to thwart the Word of God, and, and everybody seems to have an opinion on who Jesus is. Then we look at whoever else's opinion of Jesus is before diving into the Word of God and let the Word of God describe who Jesus is. And so Paul is saying to you, you to you who are faithful and holy, but he says faithful. The Greek word 
for this word faithful means this. It means carrying the idea of being trustworthy and reliable. Trustworthy and reliable. God's word talks a lot about integrity and, and being trustworthy. There's no room for gossip. There's no room for, for, for being unfaithful. And unfortunately, I'm, not, I'm very, I tread lightly when I say this. We've all seen leaders in the faith. And we've read about leaders in the faith that have fallen. But God picks them back up. But there are folks, men and women, that if we're not remaining faithful and reliable and be trustworthy, oh, there's, there's a problem there. But in other words, listen, he says to the faithful of these, we are to be genuine reproductions of Christ. We are to, be, we are to reproduce what God's word says out in a world that is lost. But he also said to God's holy people, brothers and sisters, that, that, that word right there means saints. A saint or brother or sister is one who is simply any sinner who is saved by grace, but yet faithful to Jesus. And then this is what I wanted to get to, too, is that it says to God's holy people. Now listen carefully. He says to God's holy people. It is a word that has been abused today because it's been attached to filthy language. But it's in this description, the word holy, this is what we were called to do. To God's holy people, what did he mean by that? Comes from a word called hagios in the Greek, and it essentially the word means separated. That I've been separated. When I'm called to be holy before God and called to be a holy instrument of God, I'm separated from the world's ways. I'm separated. I'm, I'm set apart to obey God and follow Him only and give my life to Him. Jesus is the one who makes us holy. Jesus is the one that does that. And what it means to also, it means that I'm different. Listen, that I'm different from the world. That I'm different and that I'm, I'm, I'm dedicated to the, to the goodness of God. It means this, that I'm not going gonna, I'm, I'm to watch things. I'm not going to watch things about, everything, about what everybody else thinks that is important to watch out in the world. I'm not going to watch things that looks to be the most, that everybody else thinks that's popular, that does not honor Christ, that does not honor God. It, talks, it's, it means this, that, I, that you aren't going to get like everybody else in your, in your, in your pursuit in, of, 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 of making a career, your business, your, 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 your apartment or, or, or your home, every, places out there. You're not going to go like them. You're not going to be like everybody else. He talks about being holy, that I'm set apart to be sacred by, by God's grace, that I'm different from the world that I live in. And I choose that path because of what Jesus has done for me and done for you. Think about this in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah was in the presence of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, you talk about a holy moment. And you know what? There are times where we, where we get in these moments with God, in these moments with Jesus, and it should be producing holiness in our lives. And prayerfully, that as we move forward in this church, that we see transformation in people's lives. That's why we see people... Uh, that we've implemented things in the service to get to pray and to seek God and to build us up in worship. And by the way, being holy is being found when we truly worship Jesus in worship. Look at this in Isaiah 6, 1. And if you haven't turned to it, just listen to it for a moment. It says this, in the year of King Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seating on a throne. And the train of his robe was filled, the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphim, each with six wings. Now, I want you to know something. A seraphim, it had six wings. Now, look, I want you to know that's not describing something weird. That's not something, and, and, and listen, that's very holy. But I do want you to know this that we as Christians, when we die, we don't get wings. And I don't mean that ugly. But we don't turn into angels. But you know people believe that. And I don't mean to be ugly and critical. And, and just hopefully you can think about this. And, but, but I see posts sometimes. And I understand they're trying to grieve. 
But folks, when we die, we don't gain any wings. You know what we gain? We gain Jesus. We gain heaven. And we're going to have a body one day that's going to be changed. And when we die from this world, this body is decaying. And, and, and any funeral, that's, and I've done two this week, and, and that body is just a shell. And God gives us this body, but this body, it, because of sin, is decaying and all of that. But when we die, and we one day we're going to have a new spiritual body, a new body that's no more pain, no more hurt, no more filthy thoughts, no more, I mean, everything that we've had to deal with, no more knee, knee problems. <laughs> No more, no more back trouble. No more dealing with sin either. Some of you are going to get your hair back. <laughs> I don't know about that. That's just fun. I, I love picking some guys in here and they know who I'm talking about, but they'll probably deal with me after church. <laughs> but here's Isaiah. Listen. He says, Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. Now get this picture. And with two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. Wow. <laughs> that's that's You talk about an extraterrestrial. But here, that's not the main point. But look at what they were doing. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. And when... Isaiah encountered God. Look at what he said. Look at what he did. He said, woe is me. I am ruined for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for then i heard a voice from the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us and i said here i am send me isaiah had one of those encounters just like paul did but just like us when we encounter christ and we do we follow christ and we are to be obedient to jesus or through his holy spirit but he said holy 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 and Jesus Christ is the only God that can make you and me holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16 talks about this. He, he says, he said, he, he gave it kind of as a command. He said this. He said, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy. Because I am holy. That's also found in Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7. Listen, listen to me, listen to me. It means that I desire to be sacred, to be pure, to be, to be holy. But to be, to be someone that is so in love with Jesus that he rubs off on us. And that he looks at us and people see us. But not just that, but in our heart. Our heart is being changed to be holy like Jesus. Not to become holier than thou. But this is what holiness is. Listen. Here's another definition. It's becoming what I worship. Listen. Becoming what I worship. Do you know how true that is? By what people worship today? By how I worship. People that worship other gods and people, people that worship the God of their stomach or the God of, their, the God of materialism or the God of, of this philosophy and this philosophy and this religion and this religion. You better be careful what you worship. God is a jealous God. God is a holy God. But the positive thing is, is that when we cry out to be holy and we worship, it's becoming what I worship. On Christ, the solid rock I So he gets there, the description of the believers there. Gosh, I'm going to have to end it here. <laughs> but before I do, just one quick thing, the third thing, I, I'm probably going to have to come back to it. But the theme of Colossians, let me, just, let me just sum it up. I'll do my best because I've got to go over and tell you what the outside, next week I'll be able to share with you what went on outside the church that influenced them from being holy. 
the things that they dealt with from being holy. And listen, there are many, many, let me just say this. Busyness, listen, don't, don't, don't leave me because this is important. It ought to be important. But let me tell you something. Busyness will keep you from holiness. It's a day-by-day -day thing. Walking by the, by the Spirit. Not gratifying the desires of the flesh. Doing that is praying and reading God's Word, letting God's Word change you. Again, I love that phrase, becoming what I worship, becoming what I read, and becoming who I'm led by, which is the Spirit of the living God. But the main theme of Colossians is this, is the absolute supremacy of Christ. That Jesus Christ is supreme above any other God or any other religion. And in this church, it dealt with a number of heresies and difficulties that they faced in the church and outside the church, which, like I said, we'll get in soon. But Jesus Christ is the one who in, is the highest in rank, highest in quality. Jesus Christ is the ultimate God, and he lays forth that declaration because back then you had this, you know, you've heard the God of Zeus. You've heard the God of of Sunday, the, where we get the word Sunday, the day that we live, that we come into this room. Do you know that that came from, that was originated from a pagan society, the word Sunday? And I'm not asking you to go out and, and quit saying the word Sunday. I, I say it, you say it. But the word Sunday, it had influence from Greek philosophy, from philosophy out there, from the sun god, the fertile god, the goddess, excuse me, the goddess of sun, the goddess of sun, meaning fertile, and, and, and that's, that's what suppresses us if we're not careful. All of these different ideologies and philosophies out there, and I'm not trying to be above anybody's head this morning, it's just stuff that's out there that seems to denigrate who Jesus Christ is and who he is and his word. Folks, let me say it again. Oh, God's word is, is God's word three-fourths true? Is God's words halfway true? Is God's just a quarter of the way true? God's word, is it just quarter of the way true? Quarter, is it just, just this part in the Bible is true, but this part in the Bible is not true? It's just there? And, and no, no, uh, uh, uh. We have to accept to understand that God's word backs itself up. And I'm here to tell you, and I'll die on this hill any day of the week, that the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, it is the word of God. It is no errors. Every little Everything that was written in the original language, the Hebrew and the Greek, everything that was written down, there are no errors in it. There is, it is complete. It is right for you and me to be governed by, to live by, to worship by, and to be holy, holy, holy. I'm going to ask you to stand quietly and reverently. As we enter this time of invitation, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to bow your head and close your eyes. I really don't want any, I know, but just, I encourage you, just right there in your own place, bow your head and close your eyes. That way you don't have to be distracted by anything around you. And, but we come to another important part of our service today. The invitation because when you preach the word of God, I believe there's moments where you have to give an invitation because God's word goes out and it speaks. But I, I'm not the one that changes anybody's life. I can't make anybody come forward. I can't make, it's not about what you, it's not about what you look like, how you come. But there may be day, some here today, as Jim prayed earlier, there may be someone here today that you're a Christian. You, you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and it's, time to make that public it's time to follow christ in believers baptism obedience to the word of god obedience and um, get your baptism taken care of that's not a ceremonial thing baptism is a biblical thing there may be someone here today as jim said a while ago that want to desire to become and be a part of this church today may be the day that you join and join this fellowship this local body of believers and get involved and get into it as church the family of God or you may be here today Whew. God has somehow spoken to you and and you need to come and possibly pray or 
walk down here again, walk down here to the altar. And by the way, you know, I hope we can get over this. We can. That whatever invitation we have, whether it's in the middle of the service, the time of coming to the altar, or at the end of the time, listen, none of that is anybody's business about who comes forward. Don't look at what, don't think what other people are going to think if you come forward. Because what we do in our church, we've been conditioned this way, that whoever comes down in the invitation, they're either going to be saved, they're going to follow Christ in baptism, or they're dealing with sin in their own life. And if we're not careful, we can, we can fall into judgment. But God knows the heart. But this is the invitation to respond in faith about a decision that God may have you do. It may be going to get somebody to pray with. It may be going somehow today. Maybe the Spirit of the Lord has revealed to you that you need to apologize to somebody. Or you need to tell somebody as a brother or sister in Christ, hey, I love you. I want you to know that. I'm cheering for you this week. I'm praying for you this week. But whatever the decision is, I pray that you'll be faithful and respond. Lord, I come before you right now, and Lord, I ask you that only what you can do. Lord, I can't do anything to anybody. I can't change anybody's heart. But Lord, I know that you can and know that your Holy Spirit works in people's lives. And Lord, I pray today that God, upon this very moment, in this sacred moment, Father, that we will respond. God, you've called us to be holy, holy. Maybe someone's here today. You're not, you, you, you know, you, you just feel like you're filthy. You're not holy. You just feel like you're filthy. You're a believer in Christ, and you may have gotten away from Christ. Can I tell you today, you can come home? That's what, that's what, that's what, that's what Jesus does. He's in the, he's in the business of mending hearts again. Man, there's joy in that. Maybe you just need to come home. Well, what do you mean, brother guy? Well, I mean this. If, there, if you just feel filthy today, can I tell you that you can pray to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask the Holy Spirit just to cleanse your filthiness away? I'm not talking about being saved again. No, no, you're in a relationship with Jesus and you just sense in your heart that I'm just, I'm just filthy. Maybe I've gotten away from the Lord. Maybe I've squandered some things. and I, won't, I don't want to go down this path. You can turn right there in your own chair, in your own seat, or I'll be glad to pray with you. You can come here to the altar. Again, we're not judging anybody. Hey, none of us are righteous. None of us except through Christ. But none of us in our flesh are righteous before anything. We, does all, we all deserve hell. So don't sit there and cast judgment. Look down on them. The Pharisees did that. Because they hated Jesus. But on the very first note, you be faithful. God, only you can do this. So Lord, I praise you and thank you. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. As I search the world, it could have been.